Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that I am very excited to discuss because this is a case that sat with no answers for 20 years until there was finally an arrest announced just a few months ago. But there is still more to this case that needs to happen, so this one is not yet technically solved, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all think about the evidence in this case after hearing all of the details. But before we get into it, I want to say a huge thank you to Aura Health for partnering with me on today's video. I'm someone who struggles with sleep and balancing my stress levels throughout my everyday life. I'm also just a very anxious person all around. And that is why I love using Aura Health. Aura Health is an all-in-one app for your well-being and sleep. It has thousands of meditations, stories, life coaching, and my favorite, breath work. Their content is created by hundreds of expert coaches and therapists from all over the world. I like that Aura Health is intelligent and personalized by using thousands of data points to personalize the app just for you. It's not just a one-size-fits-all deal like so many other apps. Aura knew exactly what guides I would like and what tracks I would want to follow. This makes it as effective as possible for helping to improve your sleep and well-being. I love that Aura's expert guides come from such diverse backgrounds, so there's always guides that I resonate with. I like doing the breath work before bed each night to calm my brain and body so I can optimize my sleep and fall asleep earlier. I come from a science background and a healthcare background, and I really cannot stress enough how many physiological benefits you can get from making that mind-body connection through breathing exercises and meditation. Aura Health has absolutely helped me along my journey of well-being and sleep, and I cannot thank them enough. You can get started with Aura for free at aurahealth.io slash Rachel Shannon, or by following the link in my description box below. Once again, that's aurahealth.io slash Rachel Shannon, or use the link down below to get started with Aura for free. Thank you again so much to Aura Health for partnering with me on today's video. So with that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Megan McDonald. Megan McDonald was only 20 years old when her life was taken from her on March 14th, 2003. She was the daughter of a widely known and respected New York Police Department detective who was a part of investigating the first attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. He had been a part of the NYPD for 20 years and he was known as a diligent, talented detective. Meanwhile, her mother worked as a nurse. Megan had one sister named Karen, as far as I could tell, and the family lived in Queens before moving to Orange County in New York so that they could have a house with a bigger yard for Megan to play in. Megan was described as being full of life, happiness, laughter, and love. She was the life of the party and lit up any room that she entered. Megan loved animals, always walking around and holding her kitten in her arms. From the time that she was a little girl, she always understood how important family was to her, especially her dad. She had always been very close to her father, so when he suddenly passed away in 2002, when she was only 19 years old, she was devastated. He died at the young age of 47 from a sudden heart attack, and obviously this sent shockwaves through the family. Those around Megan said that she had a very, very difficult time dealing with this. She couldn't wrap her head around it. It made her angry. She was so confused. And this was just a very rough time for her in her life. But she used her pain to help others in any way that she could. Megan had graduated from Burke Catholic School in 2000 and then went on to study at Orange County Community College. And while attending school, she also worked as a waitress at the American Cafe restaurant in the Galleria Mall in Middleton. By all accounts, even though she was dealing with the tragic death of her father, Megan was so excited to start her life. She had just signed a lease to a new apartment, she was in a new relationship, and she was partying it up with her friends. Things were going really great for her. At 10.30 a.m. on March 13th, 2003, Megan showed up for her shift at the cafe. She worked her shift as normal and left by 3 p.m. once her shift was over. After her shift, she went back to her new apartment where she had just moved into that same year and she was so excited about it. Either way, one of her friends invited her to a party that was located on Greenway Terrace in the town of Wallkill, but she declined. 
Her ex-boyfriend named Edward had also been at that party and she didn't want to see him. So she said that she was going to be hanging out with her other friends in Middleton. So by 7.30, she arrived at her friend's house in Middleton for a party that was happening there. While at the party, Megan called around to five or six different friends to see if she could get some weed for the party, but she was having trouble getting any. Just in case anyone wants to question this or say anything, this is a totally normal thing for a 20-year-old college student to do. Most people that age like to party and partake in things like smoking pot and drinking. It's really not that big of a deal. So again, as she was at that party, she was calling around to a bunch of different people that she knew trying to get some weed for the party, but she was having trouble finding any. So, after being at the party for a while and not being able to get a hold of anybody to get some weed, she ended up leaving the party at 12 a.m., now going into March 14th, 2003. She left and told her friends that she was driving straight home to her apartment because she had to work the following day. On her way home, witnesses saw Megan stop at the ATK gas station in Middleton. She went into the gas station and asked the clerk for a Dutch. A Dutch was a popular cigar, which was commonly used to wrap weed in, so that's probably why she was asking for it. Then, Megan stopped over at that other party that was taking place at Greenway Terrace in Wallkill. She had a short conversation with a friend in her car, but by 12.17 a.m., she told the friend that she was going to be heading out because she was going to go smoke a blunt. By 12.20 a.m., Megan made a phone call to an ex-boyfriend of hers, but not Edward, it was another man, who was the brother of one of the friends that she saw at the original party when she was in Middleton, but the call went straight to voicemail and she didn't leave a message. Then, between the late night and early morning hours between March 13th and March 14th, Megan made a total of six calls to the guy that she was seeing at that time. I don't know if this was her official boyfriend at the time, but she was seeing him romantically and she had been seeing him for several days at that point. I'm going to call him suspect number two because that is what he's referred to as in the police reports. Either way, like I said, she had made six calls to him that night with the last call being placed at 12.20 a.m. Then by 12.25 a.m., Megan arrived to suspect number two's house and he got into the front seat of her car. At that point, suspect number two told Megan that he didn't have any weed to give her, but Megan said that she was going to be getting some from her ex-boyfriend, Edward. So again, not that ex that she had tried calling and it went straight to voicemail, but now she was trying to get weed from her ex, Edward, who was at that party at Greenway Terrace that she didn't want to go to because she didn't want to see him. So by 12.30 a.m., a friend saw Megan's white 1991 Mercury Stable driving through the Kensington Manor apartment complex in Wallkill with a dark-colored Honda Civic hatchback following closely behind. After that, no one knew where Megan went or what happened to her because that was the last time that she was seen alive. By later that same day on March 14th, 2003, Megan was scheduled to work a shift at the American Cafe at noon, but of course, she did not show up. This concerned everyone who knew her, including her close friends, family, and coworkers, because not showing up to work like that was completely out of character for her. All throughout that day, people tried calling her cell phone repeatedly, but they got no response. People left her voicemails to say that they were worried about her, asking her where she was, but nobody was hearing anything back. I don't know if she was ever officially reported missing, but it doesn't seem like that would have mattered because just the day after she disappeared, on March 15th at 1.15 a.m., there were two witnesses walking along the dirt path off of Browser Road in Wallkill, New York, when they discovered a body of a deceased female lying on the path. Of course, immediately, these witnesses called 911, who responded shortly after. When police arrived, they checked the body and quickly found the driver's license in the victim's wallet. And of course, this body was identified as belonging to 20-year-old Megan McDonald. And I want to note that based on where her body was found, police said that the person who put her there would have had to have been very familiar with that area. After discovering her body, she was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The forensic pathologist determined that her cause of death was the result of multiple skull fractures and brain injuries due to blunt force trauma to her head. 
she had been beaten to death. As this was going on, of course, police started their investigation. They began talking to witnesses who saw her the night that she went missing, who gave the information that I just went over at the beginning of this video. But at that time, police were still working to figure out where exactly Megan's car ended up. Because again, there were multiple witnesses who saw her driving to different parties and different places in different towns with different people that entire night. So police put out a notice to the media to be on the lookout for a white 1991 Mercury Stable four-door sedan. And by March 17th, 2003, a resident at the Kensington Manor apartment complex came forward to the police to say that her car was parked in that apartment complex. So, once police went to the scene to confirm, they found that Megan's car was in fact parked there. Once finding her car, they went around the apartment complex to speak with people who lived there, and there were at least four witnesses who reported seeing her car being parked there since March 14th, the night that she went missing. Like I said, someone saw her driving through this apartment complex with another darker four-door Honda Civic following closely behind. So, it seemed that after she arrived to that apartment complex that night, she never left, or someone in that dark Honda Civic had something to do with her disappearance. Once they obtained the car, they sent it off to their impound to be examined by their forensic unit. While looking inside the car, they said that it was obvious that a vicious attack happened within that car. They said that there were signs of the attacker using some sort of handheld weapon to deliver multiple blows to her head. The evidence showed that Megan had been struck in the head multiple times with a blunt object while she was sitting in the driver's seat of the car, but I don't know if they know where the person beating her was sitting. Now, as I stated before, Megan had been dating a man who we don't know the name of, and he was only identified in the report as suspect number two. Then, she had just gotten out of a relationship with a man named Edward Holly just days before. So, obviously, these two men were their primary suspects. Suspect number two had literally been seen in the car with her just before she went missing, and then police find that there was clear evidence of a violent attack in that same car. Obviously, things did not look good for him. When police questioned suspect number two, they said that shortly after picking him up from his home at around 12.30 a.m., Megan dropped him back off at his home. That detail does seem a little bit fuzzy to me, I'm not sure whether she ever ended up acquiring weed or if the two smoked together or what happened with that, but he did say that he left and went home after Megan stopped at that house party with him to get the weed from Edward. And suspect number two is the one that brought up that she was getting weed from Edward to begin with. I also want to mention that by 2010, suspect number two had died, so all we know about him is what we got from those initial interviews. Either way, in those initial interviews, suspect number two said that the two had just started dating literally days before her murder. He said that he had slept over at her apartment for three nights in a row just before they went to those parties. Investigators discovered that suspect number two was very familiar with the area that Megan's body was dumped, and he was known to hang around that area. The man who owned that property told police that he personally gave suspect number two permission to hang out in that area. So, obviously, that did not look good because, as I stated earlier, police believed that whoever dumped her there had to be familiar with the location. But as police investigated, it seemed that Edward may have had much better of a motive to kill Megan. Now, starting in May of 2002, Megan had started receiving $1,250 per month from her father's pension after he passed away. That, in addition to her job, and then added to the fact that she was known as being very financially responsible, she had a good amount of money coming in. But police noticed that on May 10th, she had overdrafted her bank account by $869.92. This was very unlike her. This was actually the very first time that she had ever overdrafted her account, like ever. Police saw that the day before her death on March 13th, she had $2,192 in her account, followed by a $1,158.33 deposit. 
Now, again, police obviously were looking into her boyfriend and her ex-boyfriend as a part of their investigation. And when they questioned Edward, he told police that a few months prior, while the two were dating, Megan had helped him purchase a car and he said that he did owe her money back, but it was only $300. The vehicle in question that she helped him purchase, it was a 1990 purple Honda Civic hatchback. However, a close friend of Edward and Megan's came forward to the police and told them that Edward actually told them that he owed Megan $3,000 for the car, but he said that he was not planning on paying her back. So, this witness said that Megan was very upset with Edward for not paying her back, so, that is why she ultimately decided to break up with him just a few days before her death. So, police asked Edward about this whole situation and he said yes, several days before her death, they did get into an altercation. Now, it's reported in police documents as an altercation, which really just means an argument or disagreement, but sometimes it can mean a physical dispute, but I'm not 100% sure. My assumption is that it wasn't anything physical, that it seemed to just be an argument that happened, but he said that this argument was the last time that he had seen Megan. He said that he hadn't talked to her or seen her and that they had no contact in the days after their argument that ended in Megan breaking up with him. This was sort of confirmed when police went in and checked both of their cell phone records. This showed that between the dates of February 25th, 2003 to March 11th, 2003, there had been a total of 43 calls between them. The final call was placed from Megan to Edward on March 11th at 8.16 p.m. So, this showed that Megan stopped contacting Edward days before her murder. These nights that she didn't contact Edward, they corresponded with the nights that Megan's new boyfriend was spending the night. But it did seem like there was some overlap between when Edward was still contacting her and when she started seeing her new boyfriend. The dates of the argument aren't 100% clear, but it seems like it was sometime before the 11th. Keep that in mind for something that I will talk about later in the video. But their stop in communication, that only lasted until the night of March 13th when she contacted him again to get some weed from him. Edward told investigators that he was the main weed dealer in the area and that him and Megan used to smoke pot every day. As we heard from before, Megan called at least five or six different people that night trying to get weed, none of which were able to give her any. So, even though she was trying to avoid contacting Edward in the days after the altercation, she ended up contacting him as a last resort to get weed because he was the only person that she could get it from. Then, as we know from before, Edward was at that party on Greenway Terrace and she had stopped by with her new boyfriend, hoping to get some weed from him. Edward admitted that he knew that Megan had stopped by the house to get weed from him that night, but he said that he didn't actually see her. He said that after the party that night, he went straight home and went to bed. So, to me, it's not clear whether she actually got weed that night or if she was still driving around trying to get some when she was ultimately found at that apartment complex or if they had agreed to meet up and get it later. I'm not exactly sure. Now, for the 20 years that followed the murder, this was really all police had in their investigation. They knew that Megan's boyfriend was the last known person to have seen her and was in the car with her that night. Then we know that Megan and her ex, Edward, had a falling out just days before her murder. It's known that she did try to avoid contacting him until she was in the same area as him on the morning of March 14th. They knew that the boyfriend had the opportunity to do this because he was in such close contact with her, but it didn't really seem like he had much of a motive. Edward, he was the one that had a pretty strong motive. It's possible that her new relationship could have angered him. He could have also still been mad about their argument, or he could have been mad that she avoided contacting him until she needed him for weed. All of those things are very possible. Over the course of 20 years, police said that they had interviewed hundreds of people spanning all the way from New York to some being all the way in Florida. They started working with the FBI and eventually put together a $20,000 reward for information in the case. They put up billboards in Middleton with a photo of Megan and a phone number for tips. 
Police said that they had over 1,000 pieces of evidence, including DNA. They said they just had to hope over the years that DNA technology would lead them to answers. Her case was featured on Dateline more than once, and that really gave police a push to move forward with the case. But even though police had two really good suspects, they didn't have enough information to confidently say that either of these men were responsible for the murder beyond a reasonable doubt. But I believe it was in 2022, police started using new technology in the case, and in early 2023, police got help from a private cyber tech company to help with identifying the cell phone data. Now, like I mentioned earlier, I believe the argument between Edward and Megan happened sometime before March 11th. As we know, the last communication with them was on March 11th, and that would make it seem like the argument is what caused them to stop. But I don't think that that was totally the case. I think that Megan started seeing her new boyfriend before March 11th. And I think the argument took place before March 11th as well. And I think that they were still contacting each other until that day, until maybe something made them decide that we are totally just not going to talk anymore. This was because on March 9th, 2003, Megan had received a call from a phone number, which she didn't answer but this person left a voicemail. In the voicemail, the caller said, quote, Yo, I just drove by your crib and seen he was there. Holler back at me when you get this message. Easy. Much later in the investigation, by May of 2022, this voice was identified as being Edwards. So, around that time, it was clear that Edward knew about the new relationship she was starting with this new man, and he was not happy about it. Police said that this voicemail was consistent with when the boyfriend was staying the night at Megan's place. So again, they stopped contacting altogether on March 11th, but they had a little bit of contact before that, so I think the argument that they had was sometime before March 11th and probably even before March 9th. Now, based on the police interviews that they had conducted over the years, multiple witnesses said that Edward had been involved in intimate sexual relationships with multiple women while he knew Megan, but they stated that he was specifically infatuated with Megan. In one police interview that Edward had with them in March of 2019, Edward would talk about the different exes of Megan's that he didn't like and didn't get along with. To police, this told them that he had a jealous and possessive side to him when it came to Megan. As far as we know, not only was Megan hanging out with her new boyfriend on the night of the murder, but she was also calling a different ex. It seemed that this ex in particular was someone that Edward was not fond of and he had yelled at Megan for talking to him in the past. Now, like I said, police had some DNA evidence that they sent off for testing. This testing was done in June of 2021 and it came back that Edward's DNA, as well as obviously Megan's, was found on Megan's cell phone. Police believe, based on that, that it's likely that Edward went through her phone on the night that she was murdered and probably noticed the call that she made to her ex that same night. Then they found that his DNA was in the backseat of the car behind the driver's seat. Again, this could mean that he had been in her car before because they had dated in the past, but... Who knows if there's really a reason for him to have been in the backseat of her car. This could say that he hopped in her car in the backseat and then started beating her from behind, or it could mean that he had been in the car with her and another person and he was sitting in the backseat of her car at some time before the night of the murder. Now, during the initial police interviews with Edward, he refused to give them his current address. But they did eventually figure out where he lived, I believe during his interview in 2019, and it turned out that Edward's residence was located only 500 feet away from the Kensington Manor apartment complex, which is where her car was found. And as we know from before, it was stated that a dark-colored Honda Civic hatchback was following closely behind her at that apartment complex. Edward drove a purple Honda Civic hatchback, so his car matched the one that was following behind her on the night of her murder. Police said that based on where Megan's distinct looking car was parked in that apartment complex, Edward would have easily been able to see it from his apartment. Not just the complex, but from his specific unit. Yet, after finding out that she was missing and that police were searching for her car for three days, 
he didn't mention her car being there to the police. Over the years, police have also found that multiple witnesses placed him with Megan that night. He provided numerous different alibis over the course of the investigation, but all of them, using the help of this new cell phone technology, have all been proven to be false. Using this new cyber data, they found out that his cell phone was in the same location as Megan's around the same time of her murder. Police also said that when speaking with Edward in 2019, he made statements that said to them that he knew she had been murdered on the morning after she was last seen, whereas everyone in her life just thought that she was missing at that time. Somehow, he said that he just assumed that she had been murdered, even though he had no prior information to state anything like that. It wasn't spread across saying that she might have been murdered on the media on the morning that she went missing. She was just missing, and everybody else in her life thought that she was just missing, except for Edward was saying on that next morning that he just assumed that she had been murdered. Somehow he knew that. So to me, based on all of these police interviews and how things progressed over the years, it seemed like Edward got less aware of what he was saying to the police. He said a few things that I just mentioned that really made the officer's ears perk. He probably didn't realize it, but it seems like he was accidentally slipping information that I bet he was very careful to word properly back in 2003 when it first happened and he was in full self-preservation mode. So after two decades of leads in this investigation with the family desperately holding their breath, waiting for answers, in April of this year, 2023, 42-year-old Edward Holly was arrested for the second-degree murder of Megan McDonald. They believe that he was already upset about her moving on, being that he was broken up with days earlier, and that he was still very infatuated with her. It's possible that he was the one following close behind her and he either confronted her or she let him in the car with her if he offered weed or if they had, you know, said, oh, I'll meet you at this apartment complex so we can smoke together in your car. Whatever the case was, it seemed like he was the one following closely behind her, and at some point, it seems like he snuck in the car or was invited into the car behind her since his DNA was found in the back seat. I think somehow he found out that she was contacting her ex, and obviously he knew about the new boyfriend that she was seeing at the time, and then I think he flew into a fit of rage and killed her. And I think that is why it's second degree murder because I think it's something that might have happened in the spur of the moment. Either that or he did plan it and police just can't prove that aspect of it, so he was charged with second degree. The criminal complaint that police released detailed that they believed that there was significant overkill in this case. That it's clear that there was such rage behind whoever killed her and that Edward is the one who has the motive. He is known to be with her that night, and all of this evidence points directly at him. Police were so proud to announce the arrest in this 20-year-old cold case. They brought Edward in with Megan's family tearfully watching as he was being transported. He was shown in a wheelchair being transported. Apparently, he's been using a wheelchair since 2007 after being involved in a serious car accident. When he was at that press conference, he was defiant. He was saying that the police are just parading him around like a monkey. He said that he didn't do this, and he got support from two girls in the crowd who appeared to be his daughters. Megan was an outgoing, generous young woman with a, pub a bubbly personality and an infectious smile. Megan was very, very popular, and many people were proud to call her a friend. On March 14th, 2003, family and friends of Megan McDonald were attempting to get in contact with her as her whereabouts was unknown. She was not at her apartment, she was not answering her phone, and she failed to show up for her 12 o'clock shift at the American Cafe in the Galleria Mall. Throughout the course of the day, concern from loved ones led to panic. The following day, March 15th, 2003, Megan's family's worst nightmare became a reality when her lifeless, beaten body was discovered abandoned on a dirt road off of Bowser Road in the town of Walkhill. 
the official cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma to her head. Yesterday, the New York State Police obtained an arrest warrant for Edward V. Holly, 42 years old, from the town of Wailiana, New York, charging him with murder in the second degree. Today, we executed that warrant at the Orange County Jail, where he is currently in custody for unrelated charges. Mr. Holly is a former boyfriend of Megan, and the investigation revealed that Mr. Holly had a strong motive to commit this crime. And regarding the momentous and gratifying news that an arrest has been made and the coward who killed our beloved Megan more than 20 years ago is where he belongs, in jail, behind bars. Over the course of 20 years, Megan's family has never given up hope that this day would come. And we want to express our heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to the men and women who have helped make this day a reality. We would like to thank the New York State Police for their enduring two decades long commitment to ensuring that Megan's killer was arrested. Also, the FBI, Orange County Sheriff's Office, and other local law enforcement who have provided their support and expertise. We want to thank Paul DiGiacomo and the NYPD DEA's association whose presence we have felt and helped us continue to stand. Knowing that you have stood behind us, helping to push us forward is something that we have felt daily. My father's brothers and sisters in blue united with us have helped give us the strength to continue fighting for Megan. <clears throat> Standing here at Troop F headquarters, it is fitting to extend our public thanks and eternal gratitude to those individuals whose unwavering commitment and support to Megan's case and to our family have made today possible. Today's arrest is just the first step in holding Ed Holly accountable for the murder of Megan McDonald. The only thing that we as law enforcement can do to honor Megan is to bring this case to a successful conclusion. This has been the focus of the New York State Police for the last 20 years. This was a very complex investigation for us, and throughout the years, as we put the pieces together, we developed a clearer picture of what occurred on the night of March 13, 2003, into the early morning hours the following day. So, so the major touchdown, you know, the, uh, the foresight of those investigators uh, 20 years ago, collecting all kinds of physical evidence at the crime scenes. Um, throughout the years, there's been a tremendous advances in DNA and technology, as those progressions in DNA technology have come about, we've tried to leverage those things and resubmit evidence for further DNA analysis, and that's what we've done in this case. So what I will say, because this is a pending criminal matter, is that Ed Holly's DNA was linked to a crime scene. They're parading me like some freaking monkey here, but it's all good. What do you want to say to Megan's family? That I didn't do it. I love Megan. Megan was a great lover, great friend. I'm definitely not guilty. I love Megan with all my heart. I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. I love you. Love you. But only one week after he was brought in, he was out of jail. It turned out that there was a bit of a clerical error when the arrest was made. It was stated that the New York State investigator signed the felony complaint written by police, but police failed to communicate the charges with the Orange County's DA's office. The DA, David Hoovler, said that he didn't think that there was enough time to present the evidence to a grand jury for indictment, so he was released due to a miscommunication between government offices. DA Hoovler said, quote, once a defendant is charged and held in custody, the grand jury must vote an indictment within no longer than six days from the date of an arrest or the defendant must be released. For that reason, complicated cases are normally at least partially presented to a grand jury before an arrest is made. The preferred practice is for police agencies to coordinate with prosecutors on serious cases. Grand jury presentations on cold homicide cases involving complicated fact patterns can rarely be commenced and completed within six days without 
prior coordination. The DA's office released a statement that went on to say that the DA's office had only been consulting with the New York State Police on issues during the investigation. Hoovler's office said that the DA was, quote, neither alerted to the defendant's imminent arrest nor given an opportunity to review the 17-page felony complaint in advance of it being filed with the court. It was also said that Edward's attorney wasn't given access to speak with him until nine hours before his scheduled arraignment hearing. He was supposed to speak with him via Zoom, but they said that they couldn't get a connection. So he isn't sure if the prison is at fault or if it's Edward's fault. So he said that he would have been going into that hearing with pretty much no evidence to defend his client with. There also was issues with wheelchair accessible transport vehicles. It just seemed like this whole thing was a mess and there wasn't communication and whatever else was going on with the DA's office and police, they are not commenting on. Some people think that there's a little bit of bad blood because of the situation. I don't know, they aren't really saying, but this does not seem to be the best of situations, to say the least. There was also said to have been a potential conflict of interest between Hoovler and this case, since he had previously represented a client that is a witness in Megan's case. So he said that it is in best practice for the case to be handled by a special prosecutor instead. Edward Holly was back in court for the early stages of a criminal case that dates back 20 years. The now 42-year-old is charged with killing his ex-girlfriend Megan McDonald in March 2003. There's no nexus between him and uh, whatever incident occurred. There were no phone calls, no nothing. Holly was arrested two weeks ago, providing what state police called closure in a cold case. I'm definitely not guilty. I love Megan with all my heart. With the victim's family present, investigators say Holly killed McDonald, the daughter of a retired NYPD detective, because he was angry she was dating someone else and because he owed her money. But the arrest created a rift between police and the Orange County District Attorney, who says his office wasn't consulted. A judge freed Holly when the DA failed to secure an indictment within six days as required by law. Holly's attorney calls the 17-page complaint a reach. They didn't even set out a probable cause for the arrest, and I firmly believe that the district attorney felt the same way. Uh, that's why there was the, um, the disagreement between the two. A special prosecutor has been appointed. Today, Julia Cornaccio said she's still being brought up to speed on two decades worth of evidence. With Holly no longer in custody, the special prosecutor has six months to decide whether to bring the case before a grand jury or to drop the charges. Holly's next court appearance is scheduled for June 7. So the last article that I have seen about this case is from May of this year. It looks like Edward is still out and free while the McDonald family are still waiting patiently for a new hearing and a new arrest. I don't exactly know what they are doing behind the scenes or what is taking so long, but as of right now, he is still out of jail. So that is all of the information that we know as of right now. I am so curious to see what will come of the case, if there will be any new charges anytime soon, if he will be back in jail, or what will happen with that. As we find out more, I will let you all know. Based on the criminal complaint, I do think that there should be enough for an indictment, but I don't know if there's going to be enough evidence to convict. I think that the evidence is pretty strong and would be very solid if the other suspect didn't exist. But if this case does go to trial, I can definitely see the defense making a pretty good argument that Megan's boyfriend was actually the one responsible. Because as I've gone over all of the evidence, even though Edward does seem better for this, like he seems like he had more of a motive, he does seem like he's the one responsible, I also have reasonable doubt that it could have been her boyfriend at the time. So if I was in that jury and I was only presented what we know from that criminal complaint, I don't know if I would have enough to get a guilty verdict. But I guess we will have to wait and see if there's any more evidence that comes out, anything else that happens with the trial. I hope there's an arrest made. I hope there's a trial so we can finally figure out if he is the one responsible and so her family can see some justice in this case. But now I want to know what you all think. Do you think that Edward is guilty or do you think that it could have been her boyfriend at the time? Do you think that they'll have enough evidence? When do you think they'll make another arrest or do you think they will ever have enough to make another arrest? What do you think is going on behind the scenes that's making this take so long? Let me know your thoughts on everything down below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up. 
and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and check out my Facebook as well as my Twitter and Instagram. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please fill out the Google form that is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.